that you, you monitor, you gotta know what you have, right, what's going on, and then you look at what that should be, and then you try to optimize what that is, okay? Instead of always on, full blast, leave the lights on all the time, lights really easy, you know, it gets a little more complicated. So we try to find ways to deliver that in an effective way. So one of the ways we start is to build a power one line and look for areas that are typically areas to uh, you know focus on. And those tend to be large consumers of, of energy and, and look at those, the wages type things that you have and those things are like you know, boilers, turbines, refrigeration, um, lighting, and then address that that way. So we go all the way down to the machine level, which most of the time people don't not able to mess with, right? They'll change the actual operation of the turbine, or, but sometimes we do. Like we might put in a burner management system or something like that to optimize that piece, and that may outweigh doing other things. Which at a higher level, we may do uh, demand control, things like that. When things go on, turn things off when they're not used. Major problem in most industrial facilities. Um, sorry. So then, um, basically. You know, this capacity peak demand, it, it, and this is predicted, I don't know if you've heard, but we have a plant in Poland that has been shut down for two weeks because Poland has rolling blackout from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. So they basically shut the entire power grid down all day because it's been so hot there that they can't keep up with air conditioning. And they're saying in 10 years, we'll have similar things in the U.S. unless we do something to build out capacity we're going to start having, um, you know, out we don't really have right now. Especially in the Rust Belt, we're spoiled and we don't have outages. You know, some I've been to plants, I had one the other day, 13 years, never have had an outage. So it's really impressive what they have. Um, now, if you're in a plant that does suffer from those, like some of what we've talked about, um, then, then there's other ways to address that, right? There's ways to fix that, mitigate it, prepare for that. So what um, vantage point energy is, is kind of the glue for all these items and meters and existing pulse meters. So if you have third party meters, installed meters, other systems that monitor power, things that can communicate the logics, which is virtually everything, right? There's a way to get the logic somehow. We can aggregate that together and give you like dashboards of things you want to see, um, do training analysis of how things are run, give you Excel spreadsheets every day of how things run, all the way up to you know demand charts and even utility grade billing. So we've had customers where we actually even installed energy metric, looked at their billing, and found out that the utility was billing them wrong for years. You know, so th this system is capable of many things, but you can you can take baby steps, right, and start out ramping that up. I mean, it's the same infrastructure; you just do different things with it. So the, we have power monitoring products at, at Rockwell. So you know, CTs, which are kind of a commodity item, but we have we have a wireless power meter. We have a little power meter 500 for individual pieces of equipment. We have a portable meter, like you just want to put something on, something and see what energy that's doing. We have a portable unit. Um, we have our iSense monitor, which is a, a demarcation point between the utility and your plant, so you can see what the utility is doing to you. So it's voltage monitor, a PT of the utility, so you know you're getting sag, surge, whatever, and you, you'll see charts and you can look at a web page and find the history of what's going on here. And I know, like, I've done that for Bob on historical plans to see if we were having a problem. Like, oh, yeah, there was a utility outage. So you know it's not your plan, it's the utility. And then, of course, the, um, you know, the, the different power meters, okay? And then, once you get third-party meters, that can also be connected. So if you're buying new ones, you know, we like to buy Rockwell, but if you already have some other ones, you can still use energy measure. So once again, that information, architecture, you know, for like the wages, is all these different things. If we can measure, we, we can put in um, any kind of, you know, what's going to third, par third party monitors, um, all kinds of different metering devices. This is really coming up, like we're doing a lot more condition monitoring and actual instrumentation monitoring. So we're adding instrumentation on Ethernet. So if you look at some of our partners that supply instrumentation and measurement devices, they have all Ethernet devices. So it all rolls easily into logic without having to run wires over long distances and things like that. So we can map these things and we can do it ourselves, or you can have you know, your integrator deliver that, or you can you know, have third-party interfaces for all these different things, but they all end up in an energy metric server or a vantage point server for more sophisticated stuff, or if you want to map them to an existing 
business system and, and fill fields in SAP, like we've even done SAP integration. So if a company is starting to put their energy intensity in the contract for, like let's say they build a car, like all oh, the cost of the car is $20,000 plus the cost of electricity to make it, right? So it's actually a billable line item, so they pass it through. You start to see companies watch that. Now nobody's really passed that on to most of their end customers, but they're putting that in as part of their operation metrics and learning that, well, if we make this product at night, it's cheaper than making it today. So energy intensity, moving that around, and you'll see all the smart metering legislation that's going in where they're gonna start metering at different times, different rates. So once again, most of us in the Rust Belt, we kind of bask in the luxury of this really low cost electrical power, but that can be taken away any day, right? So the, the average cost of power in the US is something like 15 cents a kilowatt hour. We pay five. So, uh, you know, the big industries pay much less than that. So if that ever flattened out, just imagine the electric bill you've seen triple. It, it's possible with a few laws that could happen. And it's another reason to, to think about and prepare for these, you know, risk scenarios. So this shadow metering is one of the highest, like uh, our systems group and uh, people like Wall Street do integration work, they'll, they'll do this comparison to say, well, this is what you thought it was using, here's what it's really using, or this is what utility bill was, and here's what it's really doing, right? That's a way to really reap some benefit out of information. You get high quality information, um, you know, that you can base business decisions on. And once again, energy metrics distills this down automatically in a standard way. We're not integrating that every time it's a canned solution, much like Excel, right? You open up Excel, it does a certain amount of things. You don't have to like invent it. You don't have to create it. It just uses that data. So if you want a time of day report for some power device, you can say an MCC number seven, section six, bucket two, that overload, how much energy did that use on the 13th? And it can all be done in a canned way. Before that had to be integrated, you had to install the CT on something, take an analog back, track it up, add the KWs, make a register, you know, do all this work. It's all like a background built-in feature now. So it, it, same thing if you want like energy usage against production, you can build um, samples, like this was for a large automotive manufacturer, where basically doing this type of thing where they're figuring out when is the best time, like, hey, if they're running all the chillers, and they have like a demand charge for electricity, they might want to run the foundry at that time. You know, so they're, they're demanding, staging, and separating, and doing different things at different times, and learning that they can, they can bank all this energy. Because in some places, like, like let's say Hawaii, right, it's not much production, but an extreme example, right, it's 45 cents a kilowatt hour. So they're very conscious of when they make stuff, and they're limited pineapple production centers. So, uh, but even in California or up on the East Coast, they pay a lot more for electricity, so it has a lot more play there. Oh, sorry. The, uh, this is the thing about energy efficiency, like where is all the energy used? And one of the things I find interesting is that now residential is 22% and industrial is 31%. In, like, let's say the 50s, uh, what do you think the residential electricity use was? 6%. Okay, but now what do we all have in our house, right? Like we got routers and big TVs and, you know, lights all over the place. Air Microwaves. Air, air conditioning is the big one. Just like a Polish thing that's caused by air conditioning. So that's the heavy hitter. And uh, so, you know, and, and of course transportation in, in the industry have actually been pretty flat, but um, and, and as commercial, but this residential just keeps growing and that's why you're seeing much more focus in the residential market of at least trying to do lighting and, and higher efficiency um, air conditioning and things. But if you look, this is the you know the motors. If you look at motor-driven energy, which is most of the industrial sector we work on, it's mostly motor-driven equipment, right? Whether it be a compressor, a pump, fan, or it's really a motor is what's doing that. And then the load load changes. But even here, much like the uh, much like the residential world, um, air unitary air conditioning is still, like, if you, if you add the chillers in, it's about half, right? That's just the big load, you know, because the sun and heat is a big deal to get rid of. Lighting, let's get some breakouts here, just kind of give you an idea of, you know, where all the commercial building energy is. And, and lighting is a big thing uh, in, in that area. It's one of the most dynamic and changing things. And once again, also, I like to look at these satellite maps of, 
you know, background light. If you look at one of these from the 50s, it looks like about seven or eight little dots of light, and now the whole country's lit. Yeah. The prior slide, do you by chance have any idea what that image is like for, say, Europe? As far as the driven motors or the well, air conditioning? When you make, well, the air conditioning and chiller comparison on the industrial side, or, you know, what residential makes up of their one, one luxury we have in the U.S. is that we're a pretty flat society, okay? If you go to Europe, if you go to Germany, right, 80% solar because of their incentives, right? And if you go to Romania, like, it, they look like the 50s, okay? So it's very diverse, so it's hard to compare those two. So it, I know I, 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 we do have it. I mean, I, if you want to get it, I can get it for EMA. They probably have something like it, but it would look more like this one and less like this one. It would be very... It would probably be like lighting and you know broken up because there's not as much information. And they had the luxury of skipping some things like right there's there's no DC motors in Europe, right? They didn't even have drives there. They just went right to AC. Kind of like there are no landlines in China. They only use cell phones. So there's some of that that like it's really starkly different when you do a global perspective. And we have those at Rock Hall as a global company. We can give you those, but we're focused on a domestic, you know. So um, let's talk about, you know, once again, the big, the big thing for lighting. Lighting, I think, is pretty much a slam dunk um, nowadays with the new technology. The one of them that's, that's not a slam dunk and that people don't change, and it is a big problem, is the transformer for many different reasons. And it, it, most, number one reason is it's really expensive and it's usually complicated and you have to go down in a big way to mess with your, your transformers. So, don't forget when you are looking at, at the transformer system is what are the efficiencies, what are like the risks and things like that in these transformers. And we partner, we don't make any kind of big transformers, we partner with people to help supply those when you don't do it. Um, and it, once again, anything I say, you know, can be delivered by Wasp Venture Integrator, right? So they're gonna help you do this in the right way with us as a partner to them in, in delivering that. So, you know, the same thing, motors, I mean, this was huge, you know, 10 years ago, but it's still, we have companies that are just getting there. Like just, I just had a huge company um, last week do, we're gonna start right size of our motors. They're gonna do motor surveys, and check the amps, and see if they're oversized, and actually change them out. So it's starting to become more in vogue. A lot of that's driven by utility rebates and things, which once again, your, your, uh, your vendor can help you uh, pick those. So, you know, energy efficient motors just like light bulbs. If you change to, you know, this, it might be going round and round, but it's wasting energy at the time. So what, what confuses people, like a 100 horsepower motor, right, can burn, even at our utility rates, $25,000 of electricity a year. So it, it uses many more times its investment cost, right? So that's one thing people forget. They think it's just working. You know, if it's spinning, it's good, but there are cases where that's not the case. Another one that's, that's kind of a new one that I, we didn't really look at 10 years ago, but we look at now, is just the pure efficiency of these new gear systems, right? So these new gear systems are much more efficient, they last a lot longer. Um, you can get, you know, if you have worm gear or inline help, you can change these out to new technologies. And once again, um, we used to own gearbox companies, but now it's Rockwell doesn't, but we still help you select them. Rising soft stars, of course, you know, we have this little Rockwell energy cap that it goes on an iPhone or an Android, you can put it on your phone and say, if I'm this and doing this load, here's what I say. Like, you just put in the numbers, right? It's the same for all vendors, right? It's kilowatt hours, the efficiency, the infinity curve. But if you want a quick way of saying, wow, look at this fan, it's only running at half speed all the time. What if I put it, or half load, whatever, it's damped all the way down. I mean, I've seen dampers, I've seen a 400 horsepower damper that's 95% damped. I mean, it's like, it's ridiculous. Right, so you see something ridiculous like that. I mean, I, I once got a guy a fishing boat who got paid half the savings in the first year. I mean, so he got like fifty-six thousand dollars for the savings, which was they retracted that offer after a few of these guys cashed in. But um, you know, it's it's amazing what some of these, how wasteful some of these things are because it's working, right? But it's it's ninety-five percent damp. Like we can all today, we can you can drive home by putting a concrete block on your gas pedal and using your brake to get home. But you're probably going to be almost out of gas by the time it works. Your engine's going to blow off, one of the two. But I mean, that's what it's like. 
people would think you're crazy if you throw bones like that, but we run all kinds of stuff in the factory like that all the time. So drives, all they do is optimize the load, you know, to the current to the load, so it's operating at an efficient point at whatever load point it's, it, it's operating at. I mean, that's the advantage of anybody's drive on, on a motor, you know, and then the energy efficient of motor is the other scale on that. So of course we have a full line of you know drive starters, everything ever. Um, this is the same thing on horsepower versus energy use. This is always interesting because everybody goes, oh, I don't care about the one D twos and three Z, you know, horsepower. But the one to five is 60% of the population, right? So the one like, you know, I I just did a job this morning and it's 418 one horsepower drives on. So it doesn't seem like much, but you know, it is it's 418 horsepower, right? Like distributed around. So, and then what's amazing to most people is if you get up here, like, you know, the 200 horses, not even 1% of the population. Was there. So, it's kind of an interesting slide on what the energy uses. But then, then again, when we look at energy projects, we go for the heavy hitters because they are, you know, they're high up here as far as the percentage of energy, right? It's a lot more energy. So, I do always start at the high horsepower and then work my way back because it's about equivalent work. And you have hardly any energy. Uh, this is motor destruction, right? We have we have government rules, we have vendor rules. Basically, it's really simple. Higher numbers are better as long as they do everything else. Okay, there's some issues with uh, some applications, but not not many. Most fans and pumps and things, especially if you use any efficiency motor, it's fine. The um, power factor correction, another big thing. One of the benefits of drive, right, is that they correct power factors. So I've used them to correct plant power factor before. Uh, but what we have nowadays, it was never a problem, and it's becoming more and more prevalent, is that people leave their power factor correction installed, and they install a bunch of drives. So now their power factor is actually, I've seen above unit. So they got leading power factor because of some of their other equipment. And, and the drives pulled it all up to 9A. So something to watch. And if you start having weird power factor problems, it causes a lot of weird, bad problems that you know, a lot of people don't realize. So, always correct for power factor, but remember now it's getting a little more complicated because every your little iPhone charger is a switch mode power supply, right? So is your computer. Everything is a switch mode power supply. So they all take energy at the peak of the sine wave and increase power factor. So it's not like the old days when everybody gets rid, they go in and do lighting upgrade, get rid of all the incandescent bulbs. There goes all the resistive load. You know, they put all the motors on drive. No other load. Everything is on these switchboard power supplies. So it's getting um, much more sporty than it used to be to figure all this out. So once again, we do, we have solutions for these things, right? We can fix them. We have power. We have little power monitor relays. You think you have a problem? You can set limits there. We got uh, controllers that control that. You know, demand type thing. These are like can solutions. We do custom solutions. Back to power quality, which is. Is a way to accelerate getting your energy efficiency work done. So if you're having quality problems that's causing you downtime, you, you can fix that while getting some bonus energy saving equipment. So um, you know, really what drives most of these is that is the downtime. I mean, what's downtime? What's the risk of downtime? And, and so we have a lot of products that address you know interruptions and sags. I mean, I actually had a meeting today about about sags. What to do on SAG, how to set things up so they ride through a SAG, what's the, you know, how we how you go through that stage. So if you look, um, this is an example like what you would get out of an I-step report when it's when it's logging this stuff, and you look at this chart, I mean you would see, you know, we could we can graph those anomalies. So we can deliver solutions that give you a web page where you can see what your power quality is. And then what we're saying here is that you know if you get to this certain amount of time. Right, you know, relays drop out, controllers drop out, you know, over here, like, you know, it, it, three seconds of drive stop, drive stop running, all this stuff happens in a certain amount of, of time. So, what, one way we address that is that we have like iSense and iGrid, so you, you can watch what the utility's doing. So, and then we have mitigation means to fix a SAG if you have a SAG. So, um, and we also have like the motor uh, protection products. So we expand that portfolio so all these machine alert monitoring relays, you can just put a dedicated device on a certain thing. So if you think a power factor thing's offending you, you can just put a power factor meter on. Or if you think that 
is voltage or current or temperature, or whatever it is. You can buy individual little component devices and then add them together and then even put them on a network um, if you choose to. Same thing with if you're getting surges, you got like the 4983 with ice control you know, protection in it, so it'll get rid of surges. If you get surges on your control wires and things like that, it's all to do with that power quality side, not as much the energy side. So uh, this is also some of voltage and storage, you know, we're kind of gloss through that. This is showing a report where we do a harmonic estimation of a plant. And one of the reasons we put this in these presentations is that if you have harmonics or serious power factor issues, a lot of times it will affect your ability to do metering and energy management, right? It'll give you wrong readings and things. So that, they're kind of coupled together. Um, and the same thing with, with noise, usually people that don't have a highly efficient and modern um, electrical installation, they also have harmonics and issues with noise and stuff. So we kind of lump that together. But this is not really a mainstream of the energy monitors. Just touching on a few points like, you, like I said, the 4983 controlled power filters are awesome, especially, I know you guys have some like even PLC2s and things like that that didn't have all the EMC suppression and whatever. So when, when those products were, you know, when the old PLCs were developed, we weren't expecting a bunch of switchbone noise on the line because there wasn't any. It was a nice, pure, sinusoidal thing with resistive bulbs and everything on it. Now, you got all, if you look at these superimposed waves and things, it's all crazy. Well, if you have sensitive or old equipment, you can use those power filters to filter out that power for control. So we have plant services. So if there's something like that Wasper did not do, you can you have our guys do it, or we work in partnership with them and do that type of thing. So those type of things are all there. If you guys look at our website, we have um, you know rock automation, all the, the energy brochure, we have a bunch of information that just show about the different things, we're doing a lot of videos now. So a lot of times if you want to show a manager or another person or a finance guy or a procurement guy while you're doing something, you can use these videos, very succinct way of getting the messaging across. I have to explain a bunch of math to people. So that's pretty much you know what I had as far as the slides, but I'll be happy to answer any questions. charge up a cat bank, right, like a battery, and then you have transistors which act like switches that send pulses out to the motor. So you're not actually directly connected to that motor anymore. So from the utility apparent, you know, the, the utility view, you're supplying that power supply, which is the same kind of power supply on the plug-in laptop and the iPhone charger and your clock radio and everything. They all use the same technology. They use a Switch, a little switch on the front that charges the caps up and then the caps charge the motor. So you're no longer connected to that motor. So you, it sees a 9-8 efficiency. Virtually any common six pulse drive on the market from any vendor works the same way. It corrects your power factor to a 9-8. So if you had a 200, let's say you had a 2,000 horsepower total build and then you, and it's all line power motors, pumps. 2,000 horsepower with a pump. Say right, 10, 200 horsepower pumps. If you're, and your power factor is a 6.5, right? If you replaced half of those, put them on drives, they would be a 9.8, and then that 9.8 to 6.5 would come out whatever that is, 84 now. You would boost the power factor of your connected load. But yes, any, any drive connected to the utility now is a 9.8 power factor. And then because it adjusts the voltage optimization to the, to the motor, it operates at its most efficient point wherever it is, whereas a typical motor as soon as you're not at the peak full speed, full load, it's inefficient. It's more inefficient if you turn it down. That's why drives are the de facto thing, even with OEMs. Like, you know, years ago, you wouldn't see any compressors that had um, drives on them. Now, they all offer drives. Right? So that, that's one of the reasons you just can operate that effectively and efficiently and protect the motor against the fuse because you have a smart device isolating it from Energy metrics. I mean, you still have energy metrics. You got the advantage point is this report. 
morning service. So, you know, we have a whole bunch of detail on that, but we, we can get you all the information. But basically, you know, metrics is the way we do the metrics reporting. The vantage point is actually the server and the, the data log, like the database, if you will. And then energy metrics is the way we, we do that. So I thought you had some more slides in there about, um, I did not do this presentation. I'm doing it um, for Dale. But we do have extensive information on. Is this I'm part sorry. of your stuff? So, and what, if you look at what, you know, um, Washington are going to do for you, they're going to take, you know, a bunch of dissimilar equipment that you have that already exists and, and, and give you a plan for the future. So you can draw a line and say, in the future we're going to do this, and they can give you these reporting and report whatever you want. Like some people want real-time access to the meter without going and touching the meter, right? Because in the old school, you used to have to go to the room and go look at the meter and see what, what's my power factor, okay? Like, now it's all about the network and this reporting, and that's what you know factory talk can do for actually driving those reports. And then you know once again, it's like a combo meal, like which one you want. Some could do some, and some could do the other. Some we just use AOIs, like all of our devices have AOIs and OPs, and you know you can put them on a panel view if you want, just to keep it simple, right? Does that answer your question? Well, yeah, we'll get into the details. Yeah. Can I can I paint a picture real quick here? What's really cool about uh, Rockwell is, I'm assuming you guys are using Rockwell in every one of your facilities. I'm just purely assuming that. Uh, you know, Rockwell will tell you that they, they own about 70% of the market. In our arena, where you have to do those clients and you have to wear a hard hat and safety shoes and safety glasses and earplugs, they're in 100% of the clients. So if you can picture some of the vantage points and, and being able to do cost accounting, right? Uh, if you think about uh, a line, it doesn't take much to put a couple meters on to, to know how much one of your lines at one of your facility costs. You already have Rockwell there. You don't have to add a different software program, another third party. This, first of all, that takes resources to learn it. It takes resources to put it in. This is just, you got the backbone. Just piggyback on it with some meters. It's fairly cheap. And you integrate it part of your dashboard, you just map it, you can get the data. The coolest thing is, you do have dashboards with this. So if you want to put some of this stuff in for employee engagement, in the lunchrooms and stuff like that, and have it for lead and lag measures, um, it's all there. Right. Plus, it's historic, it keeps track historically, so there's no, there's no opinions. I love fact-based decision making and, and you see the evidence, and then you use your gut to double check it. Does that make sense? Does that, does that sound logical? You incorporate a couple other people, but let's make fact-based decisions, not just opinions. Then when you start talking about projects, um, rooftops, furnaces, whatever, we don't have to worry about anybody manipulating data as far as are the savings there, is it not, does the furnace need to be replaced, does it not, what is, uh, what is Burlington doing against Milford? What's Lincoln doing? All that stuff. It's, it's not Excel spreadsheets. It's, it's real-time data monitoring, and you, you, you can have alerts. The coolest thing is it, George wants to get a, an alert that uh, Lincoln hit their KW demand. Uh, it, could be a, it could be a a text. It could be an email. It could be uh, cost accounting. It's one of the coolest things is to able to decipher your utility bill. Utility bills are very complicated by design. You have demand charges, you got seasonal rates, you got time of use rates, you have fuel surcharges, you have energy efficiency credits that you have to pay for. You have some of these charges that are variable, some of them are fixed, some of them are after you have a certain rate up to a KW and then it's another rate after the KW. And imagine getting an electric bill that's automatically sent to, let's say the plant manager, engineering, maybe CFO, you know, to the accounting group, based on per the line, you end up finding out that when you get the actual facts, that where you might think line three is most inefficient, it's actually most efficient when you get the actual facts versus, you know, getting a whole lot of townhouse lawyers talking on the, on the 
shop floor, right? And giving you bits of information. Because unfortunately, you're not at every one of these plants full time, year round, all the time, and you have to pay convenience to try to get to the root of the problem. So we like using Rockwell. Like I, uh, I don't know if I ever shared with you um, why we use Rockwell. We usually do air compressor projects, all that other stuff. But adding a software, additional software headache to a client, you know, it's just not right. You know, you, you don't want to have another third-party issue, uh, a third-party uh, control system when you already got the backbone. Yeah, because I think this was an example of traditional automotive plants. You have a central plant that fed all the other plants, and they're just like overhead. They're like above the utility, and they like give us more compressed air. And of course, guys had two-inch hose blowing on their head and all that stuff. And, and then they're like looked at as overhead, right? So they're like, we need more guys to keep on this run. And then so what they, they are some of the first ones, like especially like in the automotive industry, that said, whoa, we need, we need to give these guys like, a, a, like what their usage is. Like when they're in the red, because these guys don't use anything. And then we've seen like these competitions where first shift is going to get second shift. And they do have a, they have a 50 inch display when they walk in and they're like, we won, you know, it gives the hourly people something to think about. Like they're doing, they're doing it better. They're bringing money to the bottom line. And they start making it like a team by having this real time information. But you know, the sub building is breaking it out where it always used to be. I mean, we, we used to have so hard a time to get anybody in plant that had never even seen a utility bill. Like it's magic. Like it would be nice at home. Like imagine at home, like you just run the air conditioner however you want, you never get the bill. I mean, that's what a lot of our plants run like. It's like, cool. Yeah, blow that air on the let the water run. It looks pretty. And, you know, it's all just like that. But, you know, that's some of this stuff. It's a standard way. All we got to do is link this and copy this. And you can see, you know, just by looking at this kind of fuzzy, right? It doesn't matter what they are. You know it's something that matters. It's aggregated. And then you see it relative. And this is using more than this, right? And let's say these are all supposed to be making the same widgets, right? Why are, why are these two lines like that? And it, it starts letting you optimize everything. That's what it is. So it, it's just like Jim said, it's about the information real time, getting it with comparative reports, and then going back and saying, you know, like I got this compared to this and this graph and that graph. That's what you see. And you can get them anytime, just like the ISENS report, where you can see, oh, did I have a sag? You look it up. You didn't have to be there. It's forensically long for you by date, by time. You can see who left the pumps running. So that, that's really the advantage of it. You will find some utilities that will have demand charges based on one time a year. Uh, you, you were talking about five times a year. Uh, this is in New Jersey or whatever. You, you know, a lot of times, or it's, a, it's maybe once a month. And if you can reduce that, that demand, that KW, down and just shift so process to a you know, slightly later time, if you know you're coming up on something, just turn something off. I don't know, you know, we gotta dig into it. I make it sound so easy. But just do some load shifting, things like that. And I don't know if you've ever seen the stories of Rockwell's done this to our own plans, right? So if you look at, if you, have you ever seen that to the office? Oh, yes. what we did this. So we had some like five megawatt transformers that had like three light bulbs hanging on. Right, so the transformers using a ton of power, and we, because we used to heavy production, you know, like in Mequon and all that, and now it's just a storage area or something. So the use changed, but the electrical system didn't change. Same thing for the air compressors. They were all set up to do heavy manufacturing, and now it's like a guy blows the loading dock off once a day, you know? And so we have a you know 2,000 horsepower compressor that he could have went out to Lowe's and got one to do what he had to do. So we have good examples of even ourselves uh, the lighting upgrades and all that, where we did it, and we had, like, even though we sell this great system, it's like calling the kettle black, right? We weren't even doing it ourselves. And then so finally, we did, and it was amazing. And I think it was like a million two a year we saved by fixing our own plates. So it, it could be a real number. So. Roger jumped over something that is one of the most mislooked uh, savings, is transformers that you're not in for underutilized transformers. Let's say you have a 125 kVA uh, transformer or whatever, you're only into it 10%, but yet there's three conduits over is another <laughs> panel. And if you can just reroute some of those circuits over to a different transformer, it kill that transformer. You know, there's inefficiency in a transformer, and if you're not using it, you know, 
know, 75% of the transformer. See if you can move some of the circuits around on the other transformers that has room. Uh, there was a, uh, if you're familiar with Milwaukee, Joy Global, um, we had a number of those because they had the exact same situation. Big transformers that, that were just using a little bit of the transformer. And it was like, we're going to feed them. We're doing that big time in Salem. That is a uh, negotiable penalty that you can get out of. Right. I really do believe that. There's not a, there would be a thousand dollar flight ticket that somebody should jump on and get across the table from the utility and argue with them. Come on, the plant's closed. Why are we paying a demand charge? You know we will never go up that high again. If you don't like it, we'll call the mayor, we'll call the senators, I'll call the governor. It's wrong. And they will admit it. And they will stop it. A steak dinner over that one. I'm serious. That that is a demand charge. I think we could get stopped in. 